Hello, and welcome to Secure World Behind the Scenes, our exclusive interview series. This is Tom Bechtold, your co-host for today's program. Thank you all for joining us. Today, we have Bruce Sussman, Director of Web Content from the Secure World Media team, talking with Gretel Egan and Kurt Wesco from Proofpoint Security Awareness Training, formerly Wombat Security. We'll be talking about the annual State of the Fish Report. Before we get going with the interview, I do want to quickly introduce uh, Gretel is our Security Awareness and Training Strategist at Proofpoint Security Awareness Training, and Kurt Wesco is the Chief Architect there. And certainly, um, we want to give a shout out to Bruce Sussman, Director of Digital Content. Bruce, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you, Tom, and Gretel and Kurt, thank you so much for joining us uh, as part of our behind-the-scenes interview series. Really excited to know more about uh, the state of the FISH report. And uh, I thought before we dive into details and we want to get some key takeaways for our security audience, um, but, but first of all, if you would, would, would one of you kind of give me a high-level overview of this year's report? Uh, sure, Bruce. Uh, this is Gretel, and thanks um, again for having us today. Um, you know, we've been doing the State of the Fish Report. This is our fifth annual uh, report, um, and every year we compile data from uh, multiple sources. Uh, this year, I think we really have a more robust set of data than ever before, um, and it's as in years past, we cover about a one-year measurement period. Um, and in this case, we looked at uh, tens of millions of simulated phishing emails that our customers sent to their end users uh, between October 2017 and September 2018. Uh, within that set of data, we, we look at um, information from 16 different industries. Um, we also look across um, some departments uh, failure rates by departments as well. We also did a survey, uh, quarterly surveys actually, of our database of InfoSec professionals, and, and these are customers and non-customers. Um, we had about 15,000 responses to quarterly surveys sent last year. Uh, those surveys are really intended to kind of get a sense of what these security professionals are experiencing, um, the phishing impacts that they're dealing with, and the things they're doing to um, kind of combat the threat and address the issue. Uh, we also um, this year did a, an end user survey, sorry, a working adult survey really. Um, this was um, to more than 7,000 working adults across seven countries. It was a third party survey, five questions. Um, and really in that survey we were looking to kind of gauge some of the fundamental recognition of cybersecurity terminology that is so commonly used by InfoSec teams today, terms like phishing and ransomware. Um, and so by doing that, what we really wanted to look at was, you know, how do people that are currently in the workplace around the globe, how, what, you know, what are the basic things that they know um, about cybersecurity terminology um, and some of those terms that uh, teams are likely to be using uh, when they're going out to their end users and doing some awareness training. Well, that is a fantastic overview, and uh, I, it doesn't surprise me that you list all those different sources of data because uh, oftentimes I'm interviewing CISOs and those in charge of security for their organizations, and this clearly in their mind is a benchmark of what's happening around security awareness and um, and also phishing and things like that. And, and Gretel, I'm wondering, uh, one of the things that I've heard from, from these executives is that they feel like there's actionable information inside the State of the Fish report. Can you give us a little insight in, into how you build it that way? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we recognize that there obviously are a lot of reports and a, and a lot of data points out there. Um, so we really did concentrate, in particular this year, on that actionable data and advice, um, as you mentioned. Um, you know, in general, we're a pretty data-driven organization. We really believe in the importance of tracking activities and using metrics um, to breed a, a more successful approach and a more successful program. So um, the State of the Fish Report, is, you know, it's not just about presenting data for data's sake. It's, it's really taking what we found and offering recommendations about how organizations can use those findings 
to take a more people-centric approach to cybersecurity, which we believe is so important right now with attackers focusing on people. We feel that organizations also have to, in turn, put their focus on their, on their users. Um, and then, you know, using data to help deliver the right training to the right people at the right time. It, it, it's, it's so important to be able to um, not only know what your data is looking like, but how you can use that data to make things better for, for your organization. Okay, that makes sense for sure. I, I'm wondering if you can unpack that just a little bit. Maybe give us uh, an example of something that you think you know fits the bill. Sure. Um, so, like Gretel mentioned, about giving you actual deeper, deep data that helps you to take actionable decisions and, and do things readily within your program right away, not these sort of high-level analyses. Um, it's things like, you know, our very tax people viewpoint and our departmental analysis. They really try to call that out and allow you to understand that, look, there is differences in how people are failing for these types of fish and submitted attacks, as well as how attackers are attacking them. Um, and like Gretel mentioned with the people-centric approach, that's really what, you know, this report is aiming to help arm you with um, that if you're not doing anything, you can at least get a view of how other industries and other, uh, you know, organizations like you are being attacked and what they're seeing on that front and what their end users are failing for um, to help you start to craft your program and decide what type of fish should I be sending, what type of training should I be delivering, and what types of skills and, and learning do my users need to be able to put into practice to defend my organization as effectively as possible. I'll add on to that as well, Bruce. Um, you know, when we're talking about that kind of actionable data uh, in specific in our report. So um, one thing we found in looking at the ways that our customers are assessing their end users' vulnerability to phishing um, is that there was really a strong preference during our measurement period uh, for using link-based phishing tests. And uh, within our platform, uh, program administrators can choose from three primary template styles. One is that link-based test, another is an attached-based style, and then we have a data entry-based style. And that latter one is really um, where the recipients are ultimately asked to submit some sort of sensitive data, be it login credentials or something else. And of all the simulated attacks that were sent during our measurement period, 69% of them were link-based tests. 17% uh, were data entry tests and just 14 or attachment-based tests. So, well, why is it significant that the data entry tests were, were low, a low percentage? Well, we found that 65% of the InfoSec professionals that we surveyed said that their organizations experienced account compromise uh, as a result of phishing attacks in 2018. And this was the most commonly named impact, and it leapfrogged past malware infections as the most common impact named by the people we surveyed. So this was a 70% year-over-year increase in reports of credential compromise, and it's actually um, up 280% since 2016. So given that, you know, we looked at that, and it is somewhat concerning that so few organizations are testing their user susceptibility to those data entry style lures. Um, and so we recommend that program administrators begin to use more of these types of, of campaigns um, in their programs to test users' vulnerability to that. Okay, so a lot of information, and I actually was amazed as I looked through the report um, at all the different topics and areas that you cover. And I'm wondering personally, I don't want to get too personal, but I am curious both from you, Kurt, and, and you, Gretel, and maybe, Kurt, you start this one. What was an eye-opening finding for you? So maybe not surprisingly, but the, the thing that jumped out to me had to do with the departmental analysis. Um, this is the first year that we've really dug in and taken a look at how different departments are performing on simulated attacks. Um, but what we um, have seen in this is that there's really a misalignment between how organizations are phishing their users and how they're actually being attacked. Um, while we, while even previously we've seen that the corporate fish tend to be the ones that people pick the most, and where we've seen companies drive their rates down on, um, last year really was, uh, we'll say, the year of account compromise and credential phishing. Um, throughout the year, there was a variety of attacks, whether it was 365 type things that were very prevalent, or scams that were leveraging internal emails, posing as, an, as a malicious insider, or posing as an insider, um, asking you to take action. Um, and while 
while we've seen that um, people are fishing and hitting their different departments with the corporate type fish around services they're using, they're not hitting the cloud services nearly as much. Um, and we think they're not really use. and we didn't see a lot of usage um, of the uh, fish in the wild as, as much as one would expect. Um, and, and so to us, seeing that the failure rates being greater on those and, and they're not being as much targeting of that um, really jumped out that organizations aren't using the threat landscape to inform how they're doing their simulated attack programs. One kind of eye-opening thing for me was, of course, that we saw phishing attacks increase. I think I was surprised to see um, the, the rate jump as much of it did, and actually to see that InfoSec professionals said across the board that all types of social engineering attacks they saw within their organizations uh, were increasing, um, you know, including smishing, that SMS phishing, and phishing, voice phishing, and even USB attacks jumped up. Now, certainly phishing attacks saw the biggest jump uh, of those. It, it went up, up, up to 83% in 2018 versus 76% in 2017. Um, but I think it's significant to note that even though something like USB increased a very small amount going from 3% to 4%, maybe statistically insignificant, um, however, it is certainly indicative of the fact that attackers are really using all available inroads to get to users, um, and it speaks to the need to educate users about social engineering techniques in general, not just in the way those are applied with email attacks. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic point, Gretel. And and when you think about it, the motivation level of of the attacker, uh, you know, can spur them to do pretty much anything, right? I mean, if if it's worth it, it's worth it to them. So that's that's really a great point. Um, so those are kind of the things that popped out to you. I'm wondering about a key takeaway, or is there one? I mean, I know there's a, a list of them, but can you pick just one? that you would want security professionals to have from the 2019 State of the Fish? Yeah, I think I'd say the, the biggest takeaway is using all of this information to their benefit. And what I mean there is that you have to balance out your broad needs and sort of your more targeted needs. And, you know, broadly you might decide that you want to do a lot better, say, on attachment type campaigns because you had some internal challenges with those last year. You know your users are weaker there. And you do want, and you want to make sure that you do some phishing and do some attack and training around that, um, while also leveraging in some of the real world attacks that you're seeing and potentially marrying those two pieces together. Um, a challenge you can see organizations facing is, is they're seeing some of this data and saying that, oh, well, you know, I need, I need to be looking at um, exactly what I got last month, is that you run the risk of training your users in, uh, around exactly what's happening right now. Um, and in the same vein, you can't rely on the fact that you had a low failure rate, for example, on a credential fish from January because attackers, as, as we've seen with some of our tax spotlights and stuff we rolled out, that credential fish has changed month to month in terms of the tactics that are being used. Um, and so I think a real takeaway is you have to try to balance out how you're trying to deal with the threat landscape that ex exam or ex ex exists today um, while also trying to raise your overall uh, security knowledge within your team and getting them better overall at detecting fish and reporting them. Because ultimately what you want to be able to do is use your end users to help understand what's getting through um, while also educating them and then improve your filter on the front end as well. So for me, um, one thing that I would really stress to InfoSec teams is um, getting a better understanding of your end users in general. Um, and I mentioned um, when we started that we included results from that five question, seven country survey of working adults. Um, and as I said, our goal there was to determine uh, end users recognition of commonly used terms. Um, it's important for InfoSec teams to understand that the language that they speak so readily and so commonly um, is not the same language that is necessarily spoken by their end users. So it's very likely that a good percentage of the people working in an organization, if, if someone has never taken the time to define phishing and to define ransomware for those people at a fundamental level, uh, they're not really understanding the conversation. Um, and particularly if those terms are being commonly used. Um, and one thing I, I, I really want to point out 
is that in addition to looking kind of in a broad global sense and, and individual region sense at some of the understanding of these terms, we did some analysis by age groups. Uh, and we did this specifically to compare how millennials, um, really a very important demographic for organizations worldwide, well, worldwide right now, how they are comparing against uh, their counterparts. And what we found that was, although these are digital natives, I mean, they've grown up with technology and they're very comfortable with cyber technologies, they are not necessarily well-versed in cybersecurity fundamentals. So, in fact, millennials were outperformed by at least one other age group in all the questions that we asked. And baby boomers, who are arguably the least tech-savvy of the groups within the workforce right now, they were actually the ones who exhibited the best recognition of phishing and ransomware terminology. So the caution here is that organizations should really not be assuming that as their workers are getting younger, that they're bringing with them a higher level and an innate sense of cybersecurity along with that high level of cyber comfort. Yeah, that that is definitely uh, flying in the face of conventional wisdom there, because you, we've all we've heard for quite some time the digital natives were going to make a difference when it comes to cybersecurity, and I'm sure they will, but you don't take it for granted. So that's that's great. Um, so that's uh, some of the demographic differences. I'm wondering about any regional differences of interest that you may have come across. I, I know this, uh, you know, spanned continents. This uh, research. So what did you find there? Yeah, so the, one of the ones that jumped out the most was, was ransomware. Um, there we saw the biggest spread between 30 and 60 percent um, in terms of what users, who, how many percentage of users were able to correctly identify what a ransomware attack is and, and what is not. Um, but across the board with these topics, uh, that tended to, to exist, whether it was smishing or vishing um, or, you know, USB type things. There was different question, there was different levels of knowledge regionally. What we also found with, the, with, with that type of results too was that there tends to be a pretty long curve in terms of awareness around these topics. And I think this would generalize to any type of, of emerging threat or, or threats that aren't sort of coming common knowledge. Phishing would be one where we'd say it seems it, we had pretty consistent results, 60-some 60, 60 percent or above um, across all regions knowing it. But when you dug into some of these, I think it depends upon whether attacks have been, have been perpetrated there or whether countries have really focused on aware, or organizations in those areas have focused on uh, awareness and training their users around those. Um, so you can't really assume um, just because, you know, a thing has not been in your area or because you've spent some time on it that generally all workers in your country know that. So really what comes in with that is as you're onboarding new employees, you really have to take it a baseline that you don't know anything um, and, and focus on the things that are important to you. Yeah, and just actually adding on to that, um, you know, from, from an InfoSec perspective, uh, we saw some regional differences as well. Uh, going to the ransomware topic, uh, we saw that um, InfoSec Pros and EMEA were significantly more likely to say that they saw ransomware attacks last year than all other regions. Um, and in the Asia-Pacific region, those uh, organizations were far more likely to experience uh, vishing and smishing attacks on a regular basis. Um, in that region, InfoSec professionals were, were five times more likely than those in EMEA to say that they faced more than 26 of those types of attacks per quarter. And so then when we correlate that back to what we found out with those working adults, it kind of a bright spot for people in that region, uh, we did find that working adults in Japan and Australia were significantly more familiar with vishing and smishing terminology than their global counterparts. That said, we still did see between 30 and 40 percent of users in that region not able to identify the correct definitions of smishing and vishing. Um, so even though it's a pretty good uh, understanding in comparison to others around the globe, uh, that there's a significant need in that region, obviously, to be protecting against those kinds of attacks because they are so frequent um, and because they can, you know, be significantly damaging. Um, so this really points to a need for Asia PAC organizations to focus on, you know, raising that fundamental awareness and understanding of those threats and training workers to be really diligent about the text messages and phone calls they're receiving. And I think when we look at that type of correlation, you know, uh, people around the globe should be looking at, you know, what is, what's, 
what does it look like regionally for me um, from an end user awareness perspective? Um, and do I need to focus on raising awareness of, of particular things it, given what I'm seeing coming into my organization? I think making that correlation is really important. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's that's a great point. And I, the last thing that I have, I, I will still tell you that I am surprised as long as we've been talking about security awareness, as long as we've been talking about phishing, that according to the 2019 State of the Fish, even in the U.S., 35% of working adults could not properly identify uh, the term phishing. I mean, from a you know bullet point checklist kind of thing, like a test you took in high school. And I know Gretel, you said InfoSec may not be speaking the language. That's part of the issue. But something else uh, you said, I believe, was that we're really just in the infancy when it comes to security awareness training and and this kind of work. I mean, is that true? Because it seems like we've been talking about it for a while. I mean, I would say, um, you know, that, that was something I talked about um, in the, the Secure World webinar last week um, when I began my presentation. I do really believe that security awareness training from an execution standpoint is really in its infancy. I think people have, you know, been talking about it. Obviously, there's a market for it. Obviously, that market has grown. Um, but the story that I shared at the beginning of the webinar was, you know, I, I've been in the workforce for about 25 years. When I when I began in the workforce, the internet was really in its infancy. Um, you know, Kurt is a fellow CMU person, um, but he is younger than I am. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I remember Mosaic as um, a, a, a preliminary browser, and it took about 10 minutes to get online, and you out there thinking, do, do I actually even want to do this? Um, so 25 years later, clearly leaps and bounds ahead of where we were then. Um, people are relying heavily on email, have completely changed the way they work. Um, but I will say that when I came to Wombat, that, and that was about five years ago, that was really the first time I ever heard of a focus on making sure that people knew how to safely use these pieces of technology. Um, and even five years on from that now, um, there's still plenty of organizations that are doing nothing from a security awareness training standpoint, um, plenty that are just talking about it once or maybe twice a year. So that, in my mind, is what puts security awareness training still in its infancy um, from a development and execution standpoint and where we're getting, you know, touches on enough people um, across the globe to really raise that collective conscience. Yeah, we've really seen the shift in the last, like, five years from it being an afterthought slash a check-the-box piece of your security program to being actually integrated and married with um, what you do as an organization and considering your users as part of your program and Oh, something that can add value to other pieces of it. I mean, we've seen training shift from a place where it was just, at the end, we recorded the fact that you completed it, and we didn't try to gain anything about what did you learn or think about what can I try to educate my users and improve them about. So something now we're more, I think, more vendors um, putting in things and allowing you to be able to assess what questions we're trying to teach you and, you know, what did, how many learners got them, and then breaking that down more granular to see how departments in different places are doing. So I think we've really, we're really in the infancy of treating our end users as part of our security program and seeing that they can help, like I said earlier, you know, feedback mails that are getting through my filter and help me improve my filtering and gateway technology up front and also be able to look at them as a piece, uh, something that raises my security, not just this check the box that I have to tra train about stuff, but I expect nothing back from. Yeah, and that is, that's a great point, and that's a huge difference in all areas of security and compliance. What's it really about? Checking the box or actually a sincere effort? So that, that's fantastic. I want to say thanks to both of you uh, for your insights. Uh, thanks for sharing this report and, and taking us behind the scenes on the report as well because it is an industry benchmark, and I uh, really appreciate your expertise. And now I will hand it back over to Tom. Thank you, Bruce. And again, echoing uh, Bruce's sentiments, thank you, Gretel and Kurt, for sharing your thoughts with us today. Uh, we
Certainly hope everybody learned a little something from today's interview, perhaps some reminders or things you can start doing within your organization uh, as it relates to security awareness training. Be on the lookout for future behind-the-scenes interviews with our media team. On behalf of Secure World Digital, I'd like to thank you all again for your time and participation today.